Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> I cannot say in person, right? But <laughs> I heard of you already, and I think we even have a paper together. I know of you from Laura. Yes. So yeah. nice to see that Pablo is also around. I was Hello. not really expecting it. So are you feeling better? Uh, I'm, I'm feeling better than Sunday, um, but I'm not yet there. I, I have a very strong headache this uh, today, but uh, I took ibuprofen and uh, it seems that it's working. So, uh, okay, so, so I think you, fine. you continuously improve. And nice to meet yeah. you also, Miriam. Yeah, nice to meet you too. And thank you very much, all of you, for organizing this beautiful session. It's very interesting. Uh, it's among my favorite ones. And uh, um, yeah, I'm very happy that I could make to this room so to help a little bit. Otherwise, I, I could end up in a room that was not of my interest. <laughs> so I could uh, yeah, find a nice balance here in helping you and also watching some of the videos. So pretty interesting. So I will be mostly in the background. So leave for you guys to actually organize it, including give, giving enough time to everybody yeah, to, to present. I don't know exactly how you are going to do this. You don't need to tell me now, but at 10.30, so if everybody in the room, you can explain the dynamics. I will start at 10.30 sharp by introducing you in, as the coordinators, right? But now what I have to do is actually to rename myself and make you co-hosts. Co so just give me a sec. Right, so I will be the one sharing the presentation on uh... And then, uh, so I will make like an introduction and then Marina and Miriam will present the different studies. And uh, so I will be the one, um, you know, handling the presentation all the time. Okay, so then I, as I understand you, so, uh, um, I mean, the participants will not be giving presentations, it will be just a general summary given by Pablo, right? Uh, I will give a summary of the topic, an introduction to the topic, but then Marina and Miriam will present each study separately, followed by questions, and then people can ask questions there. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 we saw that in some sessions they, they let the participants do the presentations, but, uh, but yeah, we thought it was to sort notice to let people know that they had to uh, make these presentations. Uh, yeah. Oh, sure. I think it's a very nice dynamic. And then have you calculated more or less how much time people will have so it can give more or less equal opportunity? So it should be fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think in total we have like nine minutes per presentation. I mean, we could use up to nine minutes per presentation. So we will have a short introduction, as Pablo said. So it's just one slide, just summing up the main results or the main uh, things of the study. And then we will have like maybe five minutes uh, of questions. And if we have more time at the end, maybe we can continue discussing or yeah. But like general discussion also. All right. Um, okay. So are we starting at uh, half past? Yeah, in, in about nine minutes. Uh, I don't know what time is it now in Germany or Sweden. Uh, I, I mean, it's 2.30? Two, uh, two yeah, it's almost uh, 2.30. Almost 2.30. Yeah, okay. So yeah, in about eight minutes. So are you going to follow the order? that appears in the Excel that was, there was an Excel file. Yeah, we used the order which, in, in which the videos are presented. So the videos are in alphabetic order, depending on the title. 
And this is the order we used. Yeah. All right, good. I will be in the background now for about these eight minutes, so you can keep on the yeah. room, right? Uh, I will just try to watch the uh, one final presentation. <laughs> that I couldn't <laughs> really watch. Yeah, will you so. will you also share your screen for the intro or? Yeah, I will. Okay. Uh, yeah. I actually can make a test now, right? So we'll see how you if you can see it nicely, right? So just try out now. So can you see my screen in, in yes. here? Okay, good. Pablo, Perfect. do you also want to try it? Uh, yeah. Sure. So let me finish this. Yes. You see it, right? Mm. You see yes. it, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And now the full screen, right? Yes. All right. Did you see the presenter view or only the main screen? It's presentation mode. Ah, so you see also the notes and all that? No, 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 no. Ah, we okay. don't see the notes. Ah, okay. Then I will use the other presentation because I have the notes there. So. Great. Yep. Uh, you are also drinking mate, so we are on the same page. <laughs> so are you from, uh, where are you from exactly? I'm so from Uruguay. You... I'm from Uruguay. I was Africa. wondering if it was Spain, but now you said mate, so it should be <laughs> South, uh, South America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm originally from Uruguay. I, I did my PhD in Germany and I live now in Germany, but yeah, I'm from Uruguay and I studied in Uruguay as well. And I'm in Uruguay right now, so. <laughs> ah, are you? <laughs> because of the pandemic or what? No, just I wanted to see my family. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in southern Brazil. I currently live in Natal, which is in the northeastern part. So it's a huge country, about 4,000 kilometers from my homeland, my city, which is very near to Uruguay. So I'm yeah. also a gaúcho from the ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, But because we have now this pandemic, everything is uh, on remote mood. Right, so I'm teaching online only, and then I'm back in home. Yeah. Hello, welcome. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> How are you? Good, and you? Yeah, yeah, also me. All is okay, more or less in Italy. It's not so good at the moment, but uh, I'm okay. Thank you. Nice. Maybe as long as there are not so many people around, we could ask you if you would prefer to present your one slide on your own or if, if we should simply do that. So... Are you asking to me? No, um, oh, to the presenter. Ah, so yeah. Osano sent us one slide and either we, yeah. can, we can present it or you could do it on your own, as you wish. As is better, sorry. As is better for the presentation, for the organization of the, of the work, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to have the floor to introduce my, my work, obviously. If it's possible, yes. Thank you very much for this possibility. I think it will be better, right? So you have a better control also of your your study, right? Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we um, plan to, yeah. to give a short presentation of the talks before the questions. So alternating the presentations. So it will be good if you can, we 
just can present your title, your name, and then you can present your summary with the slide uh, you sent us. And for you, Ms. Aime, we prepared like a summary with the things we thought <laughs> would be nice or yeah, sum up your results. You can okay. also talk about it if you want. Um, we have a slide and you could also present that if you want. Okay, okay. Yeah, so just let us know what you prefer because we also, we prepared something, but if, if you like to present it, we, we are happy about that. So whatever you prefer. Exactly. Also the same for Francesco. Hello, Francesco. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Um, we were asking uh, the authors if you prefer like us to present your talk or you would like to present it yourself. Because we have this slide you sent us and the idea is to present the talk and then to have some minutes for questions. And if you would prefer to present it yourself, maybe it will be nice so you can speak a bit. <laughs> Okay, so it's more a suggestion. Than <laughs> no, it's it's as you want. We we prepare the presentation, so we can do it as well. Uh, it's as you prefer. Uh, whatever the other presenters are doing, I I will follow. It's really not an issue for me. Yeah, I think Maria, hi, uh, the same for you. So we prepared also for you talk of one, one slide summary. And um, the question is if you would like to give a short summary of your work on your own or if we should summarize that. So the idea is that Pablo will introduce the session and then we'll go from talk to talk, short introduction, and then the questions. And um, so you, you would have the option to decide what what do you prefer if you want to say like one, two minutes on your own about your work or if we should summarize it? Yeah, hi everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I can do a short introduction and write to my, to my, my work as well. Okay. Yeah, then we will, we will just in, uh, introduce you and the title and then you can, um, present your work. And so for those who didn't send slides, we just summarized it a bit and hope that it is fine for you. And if not, just feel free to, to say something different than on the slides. Okay, yeah, I have to do it now. It's because I'm um, close. No, no, so uh, Andres will, will start and then Pablo will okay. say something about the session and then we'll go from talk to talk and we will okay, keep okay. the order which was used for the videos. So it's not the same order as in the Excel file, but it's the order where the, uh, how the videos were presented. But we will just let you know which, which talk is next. And So I think I will just uh, wait a little bit more because I see that people are coming in in an exponential rate. So might be good to wait a, a few seconds more. But I will already share my screen here so people will know they are in the right room, for instance. So hello everybody, welcome to session 13, which is about biodiverse and functional stability linkages under changing disturbance regimes. Uh, this session has been uh, coordinated by Pablo Cordero, Miriam Gerhardt, and Maren Stribel. Um, yeah, Pablo is from Uppsala University, Miriam from uh, Oldenburg, 
University as well as Marin. So, just, me, just give me a second. So Pablo is from Spain. Uh, he's in Uppsala, as I told. He's a postdoc there, and his research focus are on stability, aquatic terrestrial linkages, biodiversity, and he works with mesocosms, where Miriam is from Uruguay, but she is a postdoc now in Oldenburg University in Germany, right? And she focuses mainly on ecological stoichiometry, biodiversity, thermal tolerance, and environmental variability. Whereas Meren uh, is from Germany. She works there also in Oldenburg University. She's a senior researcher there, and she studies ecological stoichiometry, biodiversity, plankton dynamics, trophic interactions, and uses mesocosms to tackle their, uh, her questions. So I will now and ask Pablo to make a general introduction. And I would like just to remain, uh, remind everybody to try to keep their audios switched off uh, while you are not speaking. So thank you very much and have a nice session. Did you see the presentation? All right, good. I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, thank you, Andros, for the nice presentation. And um, thank you, everybody, for, for attending this session. And of course, the presenters. Um, Marina and Miriam were asking before the, um, the session to the presenters how if they prefer to, to uh, present themselves, the, the, their studies. Uh, at the beginning, we were going to do it ourselves. But um, uh, I think everybody sort of agreed that it's better if if they do it. So more or less the dynamics are the following. So I'm gonna make a short introduction to the topic and then we'll follow separately, individually um, by the different, uh, presenting different studies. And then we will have like around five minutes for questions um, from everybody. And you could ask questions either by writing them in the questionnaire chat uh, or you could just directly use the, the, the microphone uh, afterwards. And, um, and uh, is there something else I should mention now, Marina Miriam? Uh, Maybe that people who had uh, videos or talks in the sessions could have their video on, as I think almost all do at the moment. So that's great. And I think it's really nice if um, people who have questions just give us a sign and then ask. Uh, the questions directly that can help to discuss and interact a bit more. And also, uh, whenever you want, feel free to to switch your video on. Great. Uh, just as you know, warning, I have been sick since uh, Sunday. Um, today, today, I have a very strong headache. So if uh, sometimes you see that I have to take a break or something like that, um, or that me and Marin have to intervene dramatically, uh, you know why. But ibuprofen is working at the moment, so I think it's going to be fine. Um, so this session is about biodiversity and functional stability linkages. And um, this is an exciting topic uh, from my point of view. Um, so of course, it's not new. Uh, this is uh, it has been a central focus in ecology since early, since early times, and uh, I'm just posting here a quote from Elton in 1958. So by then there was a realization that um, simple communities are more susceptible to um, strong oscillations in, in populations. So if you look at, for example, a very simplified agricultural field, they are generally more prone to, um, to uh, pests and, uh, and, and, um, and outbreaks like that. So, um, and ever since, it has been a very convoluted topic as well. Uh, there have been many theoretical and empirical studies confronting this view. Uh, I'm not going to dwell into that uh, because there is no time, but I, I, I will um, provide a sort of an overview of what are the general consensus that have been achieved in the topic. And at the moment, what are the main research lines uh, in the topic? 
And uh, of course, we, we care about the stability of our ecosystems because taking a very anthropogenic point, uh, point of view, uh, we need natural resources, right? And we therefore want um, stable and functional ecosystems. And uh, especially in a world that is increasingly um, changing um, in terms of global environmental changes, but also these global environmental changes are going to interact with local pressures in the case of shallow lakes, for example, with eutrophication, chemical pollution, or other sort of um, interventions such as the loss of top predators. And so, so what have been the main general advances in, in this topic? Uh, so I think a general realization has been that um, to achieve at uh, a stable um, functioning uh, at the community level, uh, there can be uh, instability at the population level. So basically, actually, the mechanism behind uh, functional stability at the community level is that there has to be a co compositional instability at the population level. And this is because um, this is mainly driven by asynchrony in population dynamics. So taking this realization, we also know that increasing diversity allows for increased turnover of different species, which then reduces the temporal variability of an emergent uh, property um, uh, of the community. And there are three main uh, major explanations for this. Um, two of them are pure statistical effects, um, such as the averaging effect or the negative covariance effect. I'm not going to dwell into this, but you can, of course, check these papers. The other one you might also be familiar with, which is the insurance effect, which is basically telling us that uh, increasing diversity increases the odds to, um, to have functional redundancy in an ecosystem. Uh, and of course, um, ecological stability is, of course, more complex than this. So here we are looking at temporal stability, all right? This is one aspect of stability. And we are also looking at how things fluctuate over time in a changing environment. But actually, um, in, um, we know that uh, ecological stability is multidimensional. There are many different ways by which we can measure stability. Uh, things like resistance, resilience, um, recovery, um, in addition to temporal stability, of course. And we know very little on how biodiversity affects these other stability components. Uh, and this more holistic view to ecological stability has um, especially been taken off uh, after uh, this paper by I don't know who young co workers in 2013 in Ecology Letters, where they actually show that some components of stability are correlated with each other, whereas others are not. Uh, and this is going to define the effective dimensionality of stability. And we have a few talks, uh, presentations about this uh, topic uh, in this session, actually. Um, another thing is that, as I said before, um, most diversity stability work has focused on ecological systems in the absence of an explicit perturbation. So we are looking here at um, how uh, temporal stability uh, emerges um, uh, in a changing environment, uh, in a fluctuated environment. Uh, but we know very little uh, about how diversity affects stability in the face of different kinds of disturbances and their interactions. Um, to complicate this further, we also know uh, from recent findings that the type of disturbance affects the dimensionality of stability. I think Francesco will also talk about that. Um, and just in the um, in the context of this um, uh, Shallow Lake Conference, we also uh, are increasingly um, realizing of the importance of metacommunity dynamics for functional stability. So we know that, for example, greater beta diversity can increase compositional turnover at the local scale, and this can subsequently uh, increase uh, ecosystem functioning, uh, ecosystem, um, sorry, uh, functional stability uh, in the face of different kinds of uh, perturbations. Uh, in the same way, we uh, know very little about the, how the loss of spatial diversity affects uh, food web stability. And they, this is a whole other topic that I didn't want to focus here in this presentation, but we know of the importance of, for example, weak, weak interactors for driving food web stability. 
So the loss of the species, even strong interactors or weak interactors are, uh, are also very important for, for functional stability. With this general view, um, I just want to, um, yeah, I mentioned that in this session we gather um, studies which are going to touch um, either separately or in conjunction um, some of these topics, uh, how environmental change affects biodiversity, but also how biodiversity subsequently affects um, functional stability. And uh, I think, uh, Marina and, um, and Miriam, would you like now to uh, present the different uh, presenters and, and so forth? Thanks, Pablo. So we decided to, to use the order um, how the, the videos were organized. Um, I hope that this is not too confusing, but here is again the order. And the idea is that we now go from one talk to the next. Um, Miriam and I, we will introduce um, the presenters and the topics. And then if you want, you can um, present your, your one slide summary on your own. And uh, then we would have five minutes for questions and discussions per, um, per talk. So Pablo, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, as you can see here as well, but Pablo will probably move to the next slide. Uh, the first presentation is from Misael Mendes, and it's about um, eutrophication and salinization um, that decreases taxonomic and functional diversity in tropical man-made shallow lakes. And um, the question is, do you want to summarize this on your own? Yeah, I could. I could. Perfect. Then Pablo can switch to, thank you, Pablo, to, to the summary slide we prepared, and then the floor is yours. Okay. Um, can I, can I start it? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, well, we were working with fishes. Um, we were expecting that the um, rainfall reduction would increase um, the concentrations of nutrients and salt. Um, are you listening to me? Well, okay. Yes. Right. Um, we were expecting that the nutrients and salt would um, be concentrated in smaller volumes of water, and then it would um, have a negative correlation. It would actually um, decrease the environmental complexity and reduce yeah. fish, fish taxonomic and um, mm -hmm. um, functional and taxonomic diversity in the tropical lakes. Um, we sampled 14 reservoirs um, at the end of a dry and a rain seasons um, between the years of 2018 and 2019, and the lakes were um, distributed along a gradient of rainfall. Um, so uh, we divided them between two large regions, the total area into two large regions that we called um, Borborema, uh, dry Borborema and humid Borborema, yes, and BU respectively for short. And that of course, um, based on their regional divergences. So at the end, um, with all of the, um, tests and statistical analysis, we concluded that we could partially support our initial hypothesis. And um, that was it, basically. I don't want it to go forever, so. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, now we are open for questions. So are there questions regarding this talk from the audience here? Okay. So just uh, give us a sign or switch your mic on and I can maybe start <laughs> so the others can think a bit more. <laughs> um, I found very interesting that salt was relevant in the rain season so I will not expect that and also in the PCI uh, if I understood correctly you have like the volume of water in the opposite side of the gradient from the sodium concentration so why do you think you found this pattern? Um, um, why do I think there is um, a small um, as a increase in the concentrations of sodium when we have a decrease in the concentrations of volume of water? Is that it? 
Um, the question is, uh, why, do, why do you think the salt was more relevant in the rain season? Um, well, I, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's my first conference, so I'm a little bit nervous, but, um, maybe if I write it down, you can, um, reach out. I mean, my electronic address, and then I can direct you to the um, right person in our team and the person will be able to give you the answer. I mean, they are just preliminary results. Sure, don't worry. I will forward that to you. Okay. I'm, I maybe have another question because you tested fact, two, two fact, or you mainly found two important factors like eutrophication and salt. Do you have an idea which factor is more relevant or do you think the interaction of these factors is exactly what makes this a uh, strong impact? Um, the original factor and the seasonal? No, yes, no, so because you have this nutrient which factors? Effect, you have this nutrient input mm -hmm. and you have the salt input. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea if like the nutrient input per se, like as a single effect would already be huge? Or do you think the interaction with the salt is what makes this big effect? Mm -hmm. I think um, the interaction is what makes it um, the relation between them, the interactions. Then, um, are there more questions to this talk from the audience? And so, if not, you can always um, ask your questions um, online. There's also this option to ask the questions online. So, feel free if you if questions come up later. Um, to do that. And yes, also here you have the email so you can directly um, use the contact via email. Perfect. So thank you very much. And I think my, uh, Miriam will okay. continue with the next presentation. And Pablo can move the slide maybe. Okay. Yes, thank Pablo, you. if you move the slide. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Pablo. <laughs> So our next talk is drivers of microphyte patterns in small water standing water ecosystems in Western Sicily and it's by Rosano Volpagni from the University of Parma, I think. Okay, I I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. So welcome and then maybe you can um, present your study if Pablo moves the slide again. Okay. Thank you very much and, uh, and hello to everyone, obviously. Uh, this is a very preliminary work without uh, outstanding results uh, yet. And, uh, but it can be, from my point of view, um, the base for the future investigation. In this work, the topic of uh, stability in ecosystems uh, has been declined in terms of habitat complexity. So from a special point uh, of view, trying to link diversity to physical heterogeneity. So uh, the goal uh, was uh, the, um, carrying out a first systematic survey of macrophyte diversity and drivers in Sicily, that is uh, the, the largest uh, Mediterranean Highland in Italy, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And um, in this uh, highland that is uh, mainly under a uh, Mediterranean climate, <coughs> there is uh, uh, many, several uh, ponds, several small water ecosystems isolated in the agricultural landscape. And uh, uh, during the study, we carried out uh, specific surveys to collect information about uh, uh, the physical and chemical features of uh, water and sediments and the presence, uh, abundance and distribution of macrophytes. So um, the main results uh, was that uh, were that we found uh, a large, a moderate diversity in terms of uh, structure vegetation, so vegetation, different vegetation units, and uh, also in terms of uh, biodiversity, the richness of species in the area, and uh, no alien species have been observed 
And this is more or less related also to the key message of the plenary lecture by Ney, Sidney, and Thomas, because probably isolation is a key aspect in our system to reduce the distribution, the spread of alien species. So uh, based on this preliminary survey, we can say that uh, Sicily and more in general, probably uh, areas in the Mediterranean countries or regions can be and emerge as potential hotspot for macrophyte diversity. And probably this is uh, directly related to uh, the presence of low intensity farming systems compared to uh, temperate regions, for example, North Italy or the continental Europe. So we, we need more attention. So to, to put more attention and also to put more, more, more money to preserve these traditional uh, water bodies and uh, to, to, to guarantee the, to allow the permanence of these uh, species and diversity in this context. Anyway, we need the further investigation, more large database about this, and also to, to support uh, a greater, larger scale investigation, not limited to only one uh, area, like the Western Sicily, but uh, uh, to collect information about all the large uh, island in the Mediterranean Sea. So this is the, my short presentation of my, my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Lozano. So if somebody wants to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and speak or write in chat is also okay, so we can read it. So if there's no other question, I could maybe start. Uh, you mentioned at the end of your talk that um, remote sensing could be a possibility to investigate that. Um, how established is uh, this method for, for macrophytes? I, I have no idea, so that's why I'm asking that. During this specific uh, um, study, remote, tens remote sensing technique uh, uh, weren't used, but uh, in other experiences, uh, I was uh, largely involved in uh, projects uh, with the remote sensing to monitoring uh, uh, aquatic uh, vegetation and more in, ge more in general wetland vegetation. And uh, currently uh, remote sensing techniques have been largely improved, especially in the scale, um, in the scale, uh, in the special uh, scales. So we can obtain images with the reduced uh, uh, pixel dimensions, up to metric, also the, the symmetry scale, that can be useful also to monitoring um, habitat units that normally are not so large le like uh, forest or other ecosystems. So, and also with the possibility to use drone, for example, that can are more useful and um, useful in this peculiar context. So um, I think that now we have a lot of, uh, there is a lot of potential to use also these uh, um, techniques that uh, up to a few years ago were, were also used for larger ecosystems, okay? And uh, our data, for example, suggests the possibility to monitoring the, the, the seasonal dynamics of vegetation. And, this, and I think that uh, remote sensing can be useful from this point of view, because it's more easy and also uh, less uh, expensive that uh, recurrent survey in the field. Uh, and especially normally is also difficult to penetrate in the systems uh, to, to collect data comprehensively of uh, complex mosaics, like these very, sharp, very sh small systems normally are really complex and this is difficult to separate the different units to have uh, 
and a correct idea about the different areas that are covered by the different species and community. And last, <laughs> uh, normally in these systems, uh, community are uh, um, uh, built by few species. So the, the general diversity level is low and uh, more or less there, there is a dominant species that covers the, the community that uh, so it is possible to relate uh, the presence and the, also the spectral peculiarities of each species for the different habitat units. Thank you. There are some questions in the chat as well. Here, uh, maybe you can see, yeah, two questions, three. Okay, I will read the first one by Miriam. Are these lakes being close to some kind of pristine state? Are there any data on total phosphorus, nitrogen, chlorophyll, etc.? How okay. deep are these lakes? And did you do ground truth for plant identification? As I'm asking this, to ask you how sensitive your RS data identify species. Okay, thank you very much. This is a very key and uh, uh, good question. Um, I think that uh, first, first of all, the, the interest, the floristic interest of uh, this uh, area is uh, lesser than other uh, typical Mediterranean ecosystems. So in the past, but also now, uh, the botanics are not so uh, attracted by this type of environments. And so uh, our idea about uh, the real level of diversity associated to these habitats uh, is not so um, deep. So this uh, diversity could be also related to the lack of real exact information in the past, because these are more or less neglected habitats. If you uh, think about other more richer habitats in the context, in the biogeographical context, like uh, uh, meadows or coastal areas, cliffs, uh, and normally aquatic habitats uh, do not present uh, endemisms or very peculiar species that are the key, the key topic for floristic or botanics in the field. So this is from my side, the, the main uh, cause of the, this unexpected diversity found in these systems. Uh, the second is that I think that uh, also in this case, there is a very idiosyncratic uh, uh, level. So each habitat uh, represents a very peculiar status of conservation, status of trophy, so um, species are scattered in the uh, in the landscape uh, and we can found in different systems uh, that are that reflect uh, a very uh, singular and uh, singular uh, dynamic or uh, um, evolu evolutionary um, uh, history so um, there, it's really difficult to, to find a, a, a strong relation, a strong link between the presence and the actual, the current, sorry, the current distribution of the species. And the phosphorus, nitro, nitrogen, and other uh, physical and chemical uh, features uh, are really uh, varied in the in the in the area so they ranged from zero to uh, very high levels that are normally related sorry is my clock and um, it's three o'clock in italy sorry in the pm so um the the, the trophy the the trophic status is uh, linked to the use of these areas. There are uh, trampling and direct use by cattle. And in this case, we, we can find uh, uh, higher high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, but there are also abandoned systems uh, 
that are more or less with still water with very low levels of nutrients. Well, Sano, sorry to interrupt you, but we have to go a bit faster and there are some more questions. Okay. So maybe you can shorten a bit <laughs> the answers okay. so you can answer the questions and we can also continue. So I think okay. there was another question by Marcus. Yeah, it's a very straightforward question. And thanks for the insights, uh, Rosano. Like you, you investigated the uh, western part of the Sicilian island, right? So do you have any insights on what's happening on the eastern part? Do you see any gradient there when you call it that Sicily might be a hotspot of um, macrophyte diversity? Uh, the, the main driver is the altitude and not uh, the, the, the distribution along the western eastern uh, gradient uh, in mm -hmm. these systems. Uh, but Sicily is also characterized by a very complex geological history. Mm -hmm. So there is also a direct uh, influence of the ground, of the rocky uh, ground with the uh, effusive or uh, limestone uh, rocks. So there are yeah. two main uh, factors that are altitude and geology. Yeah. Geology, very interesting, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, bye-bye. So I will then go fast to the last question by Mariana Merhoff. Thanks, Rosano, do you think the high plant richness is a result of local characteristics such as the low intensity of land use, morphometric aspects, or more related to pondscape connectivity? Very linked to the talk from today, I think. <laughs> As already said, I think that uh, there is the uh, use of these uh, systems and uh, the to altitude and uh, geology that uh, drive uh, the driven the assemblages. Okay, thank you. Um, I think with that, we go to the next talk. Um, and Pablo can maybe move to the next slide. So the next presentation is from uh, Francesco Polazzo. And I think you also wanted to present it yourself. Um, yeah, that's fine. Perfect. <laughs> So, hi everyone. Um, I'm not going to read all this text, uh, but yeah, we'll try to summarize my presentation. As Pablo introduced very nicely, uh, we know now that stability is a multi-conceptional, um, yeah, it's a multi-dimensional concept and we need several metrics to quantify stability. So I think this is a very fascinating topic and since in our uh, lab we mainly work with multiple stressors and as Pablo said in the introduction, stability has usually been measured uh, without even an explicit disturbance or in response to only one disturbance, I thought, okay, why don't we try to uh, investigate the effect of multiple uh, disturbances on the multidimensional conception of stability. So we use a me um, mesocosm experiment and we treated half of the mesocosms with nutrients. So we enriched half of, um, of our systems. And these, we started with the nutrient additions like one month before the application of the other disturbances that in, in this case were two pesticides, an herbicide and an insecticide. And when we applied those pesticides, uh, half of our systems were oligotrophic, so characterized by higher biodiversity, but uh, generally lower abundance in biomass, while the other half were eutrophic, so with generally uh, lower diversity and a community dominated with uh, by really uh, tolerant species, so a little bit less sensitive to additional disturbances. We then uh, quantified the effect of these uh, single and multiple stressors on the overall dimensionality of stability, which we determined measuring four stability dimensions, namely resilience, resistance, um, invariability, and uh, um, recovery. And we found that overall, uh, the effect of the disturbances were uh, less 
strong or I mean they were not significant on the uh, eutrophic systems while we found a really significant effect of the disturbances on the um, oligotrophic systems. Um, yeah, I just want to say that those disturbances were uh, had a significant effect in the uh, for functional uh, stability because we quantified both compositional and functional stability, but on uh, compositional stability we didn't find any significant effect of the disturbances. Uh, however, the um, the treatment did have a significant effect on single um, stability dimensions. And finally, we also checked the correlation between functional and compositional stability at the community level. And we have found that different disturbances can modify actually the uh, correlation between these two stability components. I think those are the main uh, findings of our study. Thank you very much for this uh, short summary of this really interesting study. And I can see that there's already one question from Ali. Um, hi. Um, hi, very nice, very nice presentation and very nice study. I was just curious if you consider the nutrient stress as a disturbance or do you think there's like a hierarchy of like, do, do you imagine that there's a hierarchy of disturbance where like there's pesticides on the one hand and then there's nutrients on the other hand, or do you think the nutrients are more of a filter that regulate the effect of the pesticide disturbance, for example? So I think that, thanks a lot for your question. I think it's really a key point. So generally speaking, nutrients uh, are a stressor, but in this case, since in an open system, it was an outdoor study, it's really difficult to, uh, regulate or change your manipulate your community and your diversity uh, nutrients was kind of the only option so we use in this specific case nutrients eutrophication as a, a, an abiotic filters because this really uh, allowed us to get to the pesticide application with two completely different communities i didn't have time to put it in the presentation but um we before the the pesticide application we checked a little bit the community and we ran a permanova test and also uh, some biodiversity indices and we had a significant effect of the nutrients on the community structure as well as on the overall diversity thanks Thank you very much. Thanks for the question and also the nice answer. And Andros has the next question. Yeah, so very nice presentation also, Francesco. I liked it very much. I'd like to ask, how do you think that connectivity among your replicates could alter your results, right? That's the uh, first question. Um, and the second is, why not using a more direct measure of functional fu uh, ecosystem functioning, such as resource use efficiency or something like that? To, to go into more yeah, specifics, thanks. So uh, thanks um, for your questions. First of all, um, connectivity in this case would be tricky because you mean that, so if you would have connectivity between the oligotrophic and the eutrophic systems, uh, I'm not sure how this would play out because of course, if you get tall, uh, sensitive species getting into a neotrophic system, I'm not sure if they would find the uh, habitat suitable. Um, so I'm, I think it's really difficult to, to make a prediction on that. Of course, it would be nice to test it and maybe something we can work on in the future. Um, regarding the, the other question, uh, it was uh, a bit related to the manpower we had for, uh, for this experiment. There were a lot of endpoints because we uh, measure phytoplankton, zooplankton, macroinvertebrates for, you know, during several, um, yeah, with several sampling uh, dates. And we didn't have many people and we had to kind of, uh, yeah, select what to measure. But uh, I'm sure that I also said it in, in the end of my presentation, using more 
uh, ecosystem processes uh, kind of measure probably would um, improve our measurement of functional stability instead of using only biomass or abundance. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So first Pablo had a question and then there was another question in the chat. So Pablo first. Hi, Francesco. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, so if I, remember, if I remember well from your presentation, you found differences in the relationship between compositional stability and functional stability for some stability components. And yes. um, uh, you, you found that the treatments of this differ between treatments, right? So um, so what, what, what do you, why do you think that could be? So what, what are your thoughts about the mechanism that could be driving these patterns? Um, okay, so thanks for your question. I'm, I'm glad you, you made it to the live session. And I think that's really, so first of all, um, we know because this is already, I think the third study that showed that in general, uh, compositional stability is a little bit less, at least when you consider the, the world dimensionality is less um, influenced by disturbance. Uh, while biomass or abundance as a measurement of functional stability, uh, it's really sensitive to disturbance, especially in our study, uh, the herbicide of the insect or the insecticide, they basically reduce a lot, uh, significantly the um, the abundance and the biomass of, of the system or the different organism groups. So you see that the correlation between, um, yeah, it's really specific, but I'm trying to, to okay, I can take an example maybe. So um, you can have, ah, uh, so what I want to say is basically it's really uh, depending on your community and on the specific target of your disturbance. Uh, if you have a, a community that is really uh, tolerant and resilient as we have in the eutrophic systems, of course you don't have neither the same uh, effect on resistance nor in recovery, the total recovery. So when you compare different treatments, you see that there is a, a difference in, in the correlation between, between the correlations of the same two stability aspects. Um, I tried to, to answer, uh, I tried to answer this question in, in the paper that is now submitted. So probably we can have a, a private chat or I can send you the paper when it, when it will be published because this is kind of a complex. Uh, yeah, I understand, I understand. <laughs> and, and, and that's why, that's why I asked. Because I mean, it really I depends on, on your disturbance. Yeah, yeah, that's why I asked the question, just because yeah. I know. <laughs> but uh, I understand it's complex, so we, can, we could chat further on this. Yeah. Yeah. There, is a, there is a lot of going on, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe we can have a last uh, question. Mechtaj Medjansen had uh, one or mentioned in the chat that she would have one. And after that, we continue with the next one. Uh, thanks for this very nice study. Um, I have uh, um, one question related to the biodiversity outcome. We discussed already that nitrogen is perhaps not a, really a stressor or at least a press stressor here. I found very often um, uh, higher diversity in this um, uh, bioeutrophication. So how far is your outcome related more to the changes in biodiversity than, than really in the stressor effects? And would other stressors with another outcome on biodiversity change the picture here? And my second question is more a technical one. What concentrations did you choose of the insecticide and herbicide in relation to effects? Have they been in a low range or in a very high range? Thank you. Okay, thanks for your question. So first of all, um, here in this case, the nutrients, we uh, had an addition of both uh, phosphorus and nitrogen. 
they were the driver of the different responses to the different stressors. So, um, because basically the nutrients really changed the, the community composition. We had uh, a significant uh, difference in the community composition between oligotrophic and neutrophic systems. And this was the main driver then of the different overall stability response to the disturbances. And the concentration we picked up for herbicide and insecticide were environmental relevant concentrations. So we first of all checked that those concentrations were important somewhere in uh, screening studies. So in the literature, we found those concentrations were uh, have been measured in the field actually, and they are also. Then we check the um, what's called uh, species sensitivity distribution curve. So you have a concentration and how uh, the percentage of the community that is affected by this uh, concentration. And then we we of course we had to to make a compromise and. Well, for the insecticide, is um, the concentration was one uh, microgram per liter, which is uh, affecting more or less 50% uh, of the invertebrate community. And uh, the herbicide was applied at 15 microgram per liter, which is also uh, a good compromise between uh, environmental re relevant concentrations and uh, is affecting also um, a substantial part of the community. Thanks a lot. Okay. Am I allowed to follow up question? More one. If you would if have it's... manipulated your systems artificially. Yeah. Um, yes. And okay. coming up with the same diversity without a stressor, would the outcome be the same? Adding the species uh, in different proportions? Yeah, maybe, but I think, yeah, it, but it really depends how you manipulate the community. In this case, I think it's kind of the power of this study. The manipulation was not random because it was uh, driven by the eutrophication, which is already a relevant environmental problem. Does this answer your question? Okay. Yes, thanks. We can discuss that later. <laughs> Yeah, sure. that would be great. Thank you. Um, I think we have to continue to offer everyone to present uh, the talk and to have some discussion. Um, so thank you very much for this presentation and the questions. And I think Miriam will continue. Yes, thank you. I will present our next talk as environmental heterogeneity increases plankton dissimilarity within two semi-arid shallow lakes under a several growth event. And the author is Maria Marcolina Cardoso. So I will let her to present the talk if she wants to. Yes, uh, this work is uh, already um, published, not the, this work, but the idea maybe some of you have seen so before. Uh, it is, this is from a um, long-term study that we have and then we uh, manipulated two lakes, two lakes. We studied two lakes uh, through three, four years. Um, and uh, in these lakes, uh, we experienced a, a really harsh drought there during the time. All the time of the study was, was uh, increasing the drought and the dry weather. And uh, um, during this period, uh, we hypothesized that uh, maybe the lakes could change the dynamic uh, of, of plankton um, the, uh, due to the local, uh, local, specific, specific, uh, local identity of each lake, depends on the local identity. Uh, so um, we hypothesized that the drought could uh, increase the difference among lakes, the difference due to on plankton dynamic, on plankton diversity, due, due to the local difference of the lakes. Um, and then um, we calculated the environmental heterogeneity from lakes 
and the beta diversity of phytoplankton and zooplankton a long time uh, through time. And then, then we found that the that we found an increase in environmental heterogeneity linked to productivity or linked to uh, turbidity, mainly linked to turbidity. The lakes are really different on time uh, um, concerning the turbidity. They really di differed. And this uh, difference in turbidity lead to a large difference in plankton, phytoplankton, mainly phytoplankton diversity and beta diversity and also zooplankton beta diversity. Well, the main thing of the work is that uh, in this, uh, this, this study, né, the phytoplankton was, the beta diversity of phytoplankton was driven by the environmental heterogeneity linked to turbidity. So if increase the turbidity, uh, we increase the, the beta diversity of phytoplankton, of, of phytoplankton. And while zooplankton, uh, was more linked to the to the environmental heterogeneity, to the vari variability on productivity of the lakes, more or less like uh, this. I don't know if I was clear. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Thanks, Maria, for the nice introduction to your talk. And Paulo has a question for you. So, Paulo, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, I, I, I saw your video. I thought it was a really nice hypothesis that you tested. I really liked it. I was wondering, um, so uh, how connected are these two lakes? Um, like, are they connected by streams or rivers or, or so forth? Because I think if I understood well, the hypothesis was, um, um, was uh, postulated based on the fact that during drought conditions, there is less connectivity between the lakes. And, um, and uh, the other question is because you are working in two lakes, so what are you think is thinking uh, of the next steps? So are you are you thinking of testing this hypothesis, including uh, more lakes in your in your um, you know uh, evaluation? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I am gonna ask you first the second questions. Uh, this was an ex specific work because we were trying to manipulate the lakes to to change the things, but uh, the manipulation didn't work too much because of the drought, and then we had to change all, all the 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 way to think, and then we start to think about the drought, right? Uh, but um, we already our group already have another paper with this connected uh, connection among lakes. Right, and the rainy and dry season. And the first uh, paper, uh, I'm linked, I, I, I think it's 14 lakes, or four, 40 lakes. And then uh, it's from Janderson, Brazil. And then he found that um, if the lakes, uh, that, that, uh, that um, when it rains, in the when it rains, it almost homogenizes the phytoplankton community, community, zooplankton community. Um, and that is the connection or not about uh, on the lakes. In this specific case, there is no connection uh, among them. They are really um, they are close, but there are not connection um, unless it's by birds or something like this, but they are not uh, close, but they are not connected by a river, it's both lakes. So maybe this difference is uh, because of the absence of connection. Uh, but I I, I I would recommend the reading of the paper of Janderson, Janderson Brazil, I can put here on the, on the, on the chat. That is more or less like this, but he was not facing the this drought, this drought intensity. It's just dry season, a normal dry season, and a normal rain season. But the results of the papers is basically the same of the results from Janderson, but that the drought intensification is increasing the beta diversity. But you are right um, because of the effect of uh, absence of connection. I was clear. So that will mean that environmental heterogeneity has a stronger factor than, than possible uh, connections or loss of connection, let's say, right? Um, but, mm, maybe, but uh, because the lakes are really different. 
but they are uh, in this case it's a, it was a good question because in this case i don't know if um, they are different because of the app business of connection um it, it was a thing to think but the paper from um Mm, yes, I, 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 I'll have to see it's calm because we have the paper from Janderson and I don't remember if the connective, the heterogeneity was uh, stronger than the connectivity. I, I have to see the paper again. I, I don't remember right now. <laughs> but um, but uh, just, just to clarify, uh, um, we think that the local conditions, they have a heterogeneity maybe can be stronger than the connectivity because they connect uh, the connection among them then is really um, few for uh, once a month, once a year, or even that uh, the connection occurs at three, four, five years is not a huge connection among them because of the drought, the constant drought. Okay. Thanks a lot for the answer. <laughs> uh, so I will have one more question, maybe, because I was surprised that the draw um, had not an effect on the zooplankton, even if the phytoplankton was decreasing. So I, in one of the lakes, I think. And so I was wondering if you know why that could happen. Yes. Um, in this specific lake, that zooplankton did not change. Um, it, it is, um, maybe because he's, it was already a sh shallow when we started, it was already in the drought. So, so, uh, th this is one of the problems of the work because we just get the drought, the drought effect. And I believe that anything that happened, uh, until that point, from that point, we would not change in that lake because it was already uh, really shallow and really, um, I think uh, we have two distinct times on this. The, the lake is the lake exact that did not change a long time. It was already suffering from the drought before the other lake because he, it was a shallow, a lake that was smaller and shallower than, than the other one. So um, it did not change because he was already in the drought before we started it. The, I don't know, because in these specific places, sometimes it rains in a lake and there's a, another lake close to them and that doesn't rain in that. If this happened there, because and then one lake is uh, start to suffer from the drought before. I don't know, uh, it's more like, and then we did not experience change zooplankton in that lake. Yes, thanks a lot for your answer. And I don't know if there are more questions. I don't see any. So maybe we can continue with the next talk. Thanks a lot, Maria. Yeah, and the next talk is from Pablo and he will talk a bit or summarize his talk about integrating multiple dimensions of stability into a vulnerability metric. So Pablo. All right. Uh, yeah, so this touches uh, upon the same topic that um, uh, of Francesco's um, presentation. Um, so basically, we know that ecological stability is a multidimensional um, uh, concept and that can be described by many different metrics. And of course, each of these metrics provide unique information. Um, but on the other hand, we also know that some of these stability metrics in some situations, they are correlated with each other, uh, meaning that um, they are actually uh, providing similar information uh, in, in some contexts. Um, so ideally, we would like to have, you know, instead of having, you know, 100 metrics, we don't have so many metrics, but instead of having so many metrics, ideally, we will have, we would want to have you know, um, one representative metric or a few representative metrics that can provide simultaneous information uh, of other um, stability components. So this is what we kind of try to do in this um, in this uh, study. Uh, we develop a functional and compositional counterparts of an integrated uh, stability metric, which we call overall vulnera ecological vulnerability. And um, basically, uh, this 
builds upon the work by Hillebrand and co-workers in 2018, where they uh, quantify um, four different stability metrics uh, for functional responses and compositional responses. These are, um, um, they do it for pulse disturbances, so they, they, they um, develop metrics for uh, resistance, final recovery, resilience, and temporal stability. Um, I cannot stop to describe how you calculate all of these metrics, but basically for the functional responses, you have to compute the log response ratios. Um, and uh, for the uh, compositional responses, you do it with a, um, with a similarity metric. In this case, it's um, a break with similarity. Uh, and what we do here is that uh, if the zero in the functional responses, the zero is the control level, so everything that is above the, um, the zero means that you have a positive response relative to the control level. In a, this is in an experimental setting. Everything that falls below is a, um, is a negative response res uh, with respect to the control. So what we do is to compute the area uh, below the curve by taking zero as a benchmark. That's our OEB metric, the overall vulnerability metric. Uh, with respect to the compositional responses, um, you have to do it by taking one, one as a benchmark because, because one means similar composition as the control. And um, you can do this for pulse disturbances, but you can also do this for press disturbances uh, and for treatments where you combine both pulse and press disturbances. And what we found is that uh, OEV uh, correlates uh, negatively with uh, most stability components, but not all. Actually, it doesn't show for resilience, and I, I, I have explanations for that, but I don't think I can dwell on that. Meaning that OEV is an integrated metric of stability that captures information of multiple stability components. Uh, at the same time, we also look at the correlation between um, functional and compositional OEV. And we found a very strong correlation between uh, these two different counterparts of the, of the metric, meaning that we can actually also use the metric to look at the functional consequences of biodiversity change. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, this is in an experimental setting, uh, but uh, it should also be a good candidate for um, natural observations in ecosystems. And, um, and I, I think with this, I can I can end here and I can open up for questions. Thank you, Pablo. And there's uh, one question from Andros. Uh, hi, Pablo. Very interesting uh, presentation and work. I remember actually after that paper on the dimensionality of stability that uh, I was with Luke and other colleagues uh, thinking about this. Can we actually build a metric that would summarize all this variability in a single index. And I think this is a pretty interesting uh, idea actually, but I was <clears throat> sorry, wondering, for instance, if you think about Shannon diversity index, uh, of course it has the advantage of combining different parameters such as evenness and yeah. richness, but on the other hand, you also yeah. lose information because yeah. Uh, completely different scenarios will give you the same values. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's more or less on this direction. Yeah. How much we actually lose on mechanistic explanations yeah, by, yeah. by using this approach? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think it's a very, very good point. Uh, of course, as I, as I mentioned, each stability component is unique in the information that it provides. And I think the, um, and I think that, of course, um, we need to know more about how this uh, metric correlates with different stability components in further studies in different environmental contexts, because that correlation can also change. And also thinking about information, for example, you think about this metric, um, it, it is based on an area under the curve approach. Uh, and of course, this is, um, this is not telling you whether the response is positive or negative. So for that, in that sense, you also need to think that, okay, I need to look at my low response ratios to see what is the predominant response. Is it positive or negative? So, so I agree with you that, um, that, um, that with this kind of more holistic approaches, we lose information, we, we lose the fine scale. 
On the other hand, you can simplify um, the way we measure stability in some other ways. So, but I am. Uh, so yeah, pre pretty interesting anyway. So thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty much looking forward to see. Is it already published or not? Or not? Uh, uh, we sent it uh, now, uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. So it's under cool. review. Um, okay, and, uh, I, I will keep an eye on that. <laughs> Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Francesco. Hi. So um, I think this is really a great work and a great tool, especially for management. I think the the whole presentation and this uh, overall vulnerability um, matrix is really management oriented. Is this true, right? Well, the, the idea is to facilitate that, right? Because yeah. uh, when, I mean, and I think you probably have seen uh, the nice review from Don Ojue and co workers in 2016 and calling yes. letters that there is a very strong disconnect, disconnection between ecosystem exactly. managers and scientists and in the way we understand stability, right? So, and that's uh, partly caused because, uh, because of the complexity of stability, right? So, you are offering ecosystem managers and politicians uh, so many metrics. And uh, of course, they they prefer to use, uh, you know, one metric. Yeah, that is but in, this is why I think this is great. Uh, but then I, I have a, a thought, and it's that maybe it's a bit uh, ahead of the time. It's a bit too early for this metric, because if you think we still don't know what is regulating this uh, changes that we see in the correlation between the different stability. So if you measure the overall area or the log response ratio and you send that to the to the man manager, so look, this is happening, and they try to, to fix something, maybe just one parameter, then you can have, let's say, let's say uh, an opposite response from another stability matrix. Yeah. You know, I, I totally agree. So it's it's um, it's a start, and I think yeah. we we need to test this more because we run we test this metric with a modularized experiment across uh, five different lakes at two seasons. It's a mesocosm experiment where we repeated the same experiment in ten different contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, but and we use as a pulse disturbance we use fish, and then as a pulse disturbance we use saving. And as you saw also in your work, uh, the disturbance can also change the relation between different yeah. stability metrics. That's exactly so we, my we point. Need, yeah, we, we, we need more, more work, of course. Exactly. Thanks. Thanks. Next question is from Ali. Hi, Pablo. Nice to yeah. see you. Uh, so I guess my question is kind of related to the previous two ones. Uh, I was just curious. If you have any idea how this overall ecological vulnerability metric might behave in terms of its consistency with the other diversity uh, stability measures across different disturbance types. So like if you like temperature might be consistent with the other stability, but with pesticides. Maybe not. Do you yeah. have any idea about? Yeah. So yeah. So that's the, the 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 good question that we try to answer, right? So we need to test this more, right, and see whether that changes. Um, we know very little actually actually about the mechanisms by which these two has change these relationships. Um, it could be because we are changing the way uh, the food web is interacting, interacting, the different species are interacting. For example, you could be changing, um, you know, the dominance of weak interactions with respect to uh, strong interactors and things like that. So we know very little about the mechanism. And uh, I think we discussed this once by email that when you do mesocosm experiments, it's, it's pretty nice, but um, in terms of the mechanisms, it's hard to identify them. And uh, and sometimes it's because of um, data problem, um, and we, we cannot do everything that we want, right? So, but we, we yeah. need more studies, definitely. Do you think it's possible to calculate this new vulnerability from past stability data? Yeah, um, yeah, actually, yeah. So the first idea when we thought about this was to use uh, data from a meta-analysis that uh, Helmut uh, has had done with Charlotte Kunze. Uh, it was published uh, last year in Ecology Letters. 
But at the end, we decided to use this size of connect data, but it's definitely, it could be tested with other types of disturbances, yeah. Yeah, maybe you could calibrate it with what's yeah. been done already. Yeah. I Anyways, it's I a great it. idea. Great idea. If I find it, maybe I find the time one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thanks for the questions. And I think we continue with the uh -huh. next one. I have um, a question from Maria Calderon from the, uh, from the forum, but I could answer to her in another time. I know yes, her. that would be great because we have three uh, talks left. Yes, yes. And then uh, we would continue with Miriam Gerhard. She will talk or summarize her talk about nutrient availability, which mediates effects of phytoplankton rare species loss on ecosystem functioning. So Miriam. Yeah, the floor is yours. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I will try to be very fast so we have more time for the other talks. So here in this work, uh, we analyze the effect of rare species loss of phytoplankton communities on biomass and resource efficiency under different nutrient conditions. And for that, I conducted two different experiments, a mesocosmos and a microcosmos experiment. And the idea was to compare these different nutrient scenarios. So in the mesocosmos, uh, we inoculated this diversity gradient created by dilution of a natural community. And we used two different nutrient levels, so high and low nutrients. And in comparison with the microcosmos experiment, we used the whole entropy ratio gradient. So to see how also the ratios affect uh, the ecosystem functioning according to the diversity level. So when my main results are that uh, imbalanced nutrient supply did not actually decline the phytoplankton biomass under extreme entropy nutrient ratios. As you can see here in the plot, we have our expectations in the gray plot and in colors, you can see the results. And so with very high entropy supply ratios, we have uh, still high biomass. And the second uh, nice results for me at least is that we found um, diversity effect when we consider many different entropy ratios, but not when we only consider different nutrient scenarios with different uh, nutrient concentrations. Yeah, and I think that's it. Thanks Miriam for this fast uh, summary of your talk. Um, yeah, are there questions? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> so thanks a lot for this talk, it was really interesting. And overall, I think there are probably three um, problematic points with uh, biodiversity ecosystem functioning experiment in general. One is, of course, that usually the species manipulation is random and also random are the extinctions, let's say, or the species that you drop. And also usually they use a very uh, low biodiversity level in general. And I think you really tackled these two points really nicely. Uh, but my, so my question now is, um, how do you think, or do you think that maybe the overall biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationship may change, may change if you add more trophic levels? Because in this, I mean, most of these studies only focus on one trophic level at a time. So usually it's primary producers. Do you think that species interaction and adding more trophic levels would change uh, the overall relationship? Or do you have any idea about that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, of course, these experiments um, have a lot of limitations as well. We try to tackle some and others we just can't. Um, I, I think the, um, to add more um, trophic levels will maybe change the results. We didn't test that, we did, but we did some, um, some incubations with Daphnia, for example, using um, a culture Daphnia and a lake, not Daphnia, see, uh, see, um, other species, Sinodesmus, uh, I think, yeah, Simocephalus, sorry, uh, and and we found like the, that the different diversity levels affect the mortality of this Daphnia, for example. So I think there will be a bottom-up effect probably if you include more species. I I don't know. We don't test. We didn't test that, but we also have like um, 
a bottom up effect. But this, I think, um, this will be stronger when we really lose a lot of species. Because when we have like a very high diversity in here, we only lose like rare species. So that's also important that we are not losing like the main species uh, in the community. And so I think when you really lose a lot of species, then you will have like stronger uh, effects. I think if you maintain somehow the main um, species with the main functional groups and traits diversity, then I think it will be different. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thanks. Are there more questions to Miriam? So there's, I think, no one who posted something here in the chat. Is there someone? I have a curiosity. Can I help? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, about the, the methods, uh, about the, the choice of variable versus similar NP ratio, um, what do you think about the fact that uh, in nature, in natural condition, the, avail the availability is really varying uh, along seasons uh, or uh, in response to weather events and so on. So um, it would be possible to, to test also uh, the, 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 the changes that are normally very rapid uh, in uh, natural environments uh, concerning the, the stoichiometry uh, ratios between among uh, nutrients, uh, but not so only for nitrogen on phosphorus, but also for silica, for example, and, and so on. Yeah, that's a very nice question. Thank you. Um, I think this is very complex to test in nature. Of course, we have a lot of heterogeneity and also temporal variability in natural systems. And I think that's very complex. Um, there is a model uh, that tackles this, uh, considering entropy ratios or different resources and how the homogeneity of these resources and also the values will affect uh, the relationship between diversity and ecosystem functioning. And they found similar results, I will say, as um, as we found here as well, so that the environmental variability uh, in this case related to the different ratios will increase the complementarity effect and therefore um, show a higher diversity ecosystem functioning relationship. But I think this is very difficult. I mean, I think we thought a lot about this and how to investigate this experimentally. And I, I think we still have a lot of limitations and maybe to consider also meta communities approaches uh, will be uh, a step further in this kind of experiments but in nature i'm i'm really not sure if we are able to analyze these changes i mean of course because we will need a lot of data i think and like very um exhaustive measurements because this can change us like very fast and also in the horizontal gradient vertical gradient and everything so I am not sure, yeah. I mean, with a lot of data, it might be possible, but I, I, I'm not sure. And then we lose the mechanistic understanding that I, I find also important. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, also because my, my question raises by the observation that uh, nutrient uh, competition is normally consider considered a negative issue, but uh, I think that normally is uh, at the base of the maintenance of diversity <laughs> because uh, uh, when we observed an excess of nutrient availability, this normally leads to dystrophic events uh, and the disruption of the complexity of the communities. So I think that is a very relevant topic. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Are there more questions to Miriam? And if not, I would ask um, uh, Marcin uh, Zebrowski. Uh, he would have the last talk, but maybe he wants to be now. Um, I don't know if, yeah. Hi. There you are. Do you want to summarize the talk on your own? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I can That's summarize. 
speak great. Right. So short, yes, short uh, summarize. Uh, so my work uh, is about uh, the effect of microplastic on interaction between uh, different Daphne species, uh, exactly for the competitions for resources, and. Uh, we made uh, the experiment uh, where we put uh, two different species uh, in one uh, one one glass uh, jar uh, with uh, micro with three uh, types of microplastic. All, all in this experiment was uh, three pairs of uh, Daphne species, and uh, we choose the Daphne species. Uh, uh, from different uh, different environment uh, with from the environment with fish or uh, without fish. Uh, this is the Daphnia magna, Daphnia pulex, uh, Daphnia uh, longispina, and Daphnia cuculata. And um, pairs, uh, all all these all these pairs uh, were compared. Like uh, one of uh, the species is uh, superior, and another was uh, inferior uh, competitor. And after that, uh, we made a 40 days uh, experiment uh, where uh, this uh, Daphnia uh, lived uh, together. And uh, mm, well, finally, uh, well, we count the population, the structure of the, the, this, uh, this little uh, community, uh, counting the mm, numbers of uh, all individuals uh, of uh, this uh, this uh, species uh, in from with the uh, stereoscope microscope and uh, for every every four four days uh, and uh, there is the the result and uh, the summary is uh, the presence of microplastic particles affects on interspecific competition uh, between these uh, different species and. Uh, in our uh, results, the negative effect uh, was stronger on superior than inferior competition, and uh, which uh, uh, results in us our uh, hypothesis. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's enough. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for, for this short. That's perfect. Thanks for the summary. And um... Oh, Ali already has a question. Yeah, um, thanks for the very interesting experiment. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't able to see the whole presentation. So maybe you already answered some of the questions that I'm about to ask, but mm -hmm. um, first, just a comment. It's really cool to see, I mean, it's really sad and also cool to see plastics entering the food web, like quantitative experiments looking at it. Um, so my question is, if you controlled for the food concentration in these experiments, and the second question is, how does it, like the types and the shapes of these pellets that you used, how do they relate to the kinds of plastic that we find in nature? Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, the first, uh, the food concentration was uh, 0 uh, uh, milligram per liter and we measured every day uh, with the first uh, fluorous uh, by, by oh sorry uh, uh, sorry for that we we measured on the, the spectroscopy uh, this uh, concentration and uh, we add uh, every day the the same uh, amount of food and the second uh, and your second uh, question is about the type of microplastic. Um, we use uh, three three types: uh, polystyrene and polyethylene, and the poly uh, uh, polyhydroxybutyrate. And uh, the the first the two first uh, is uh, one of the most uh, type of microplastic uh, which you found in the environment, natural environment, and uh, the shape uh, is uh, like nodules, uh, mm, nodules, and this microplastic we use uh, is like, uh, okay, microplastic is mm, two different types of, uh, mm, of 
production. First, the uh, primary is uh, where where the um, where is production like a product uh, uh, add to, for example, a, a gel or another product, and the the, the secondary is uh, the microplastic which uh, um, goes to the environment and there uh, degrade from the little little part, and uh, we use the uh, the primary because. Uh, mm, you can buy it from the uh, company who products, uh, for example, uh, scientists uh, for for science products from scientists, and uh, we can uh, measure uh, exactly how many uh, mm, many nanos we add. And uh, uh, I don't know. There is my answer is uh, good for your question. Mm, you can. Um, it is, but I have another one. Sorry, I'm just going to ask it really quickly. So I was thinking because the size, like that's usually what, like thinking of cyanobacterial filaments that can inhibit grazing in Daphne, right? So that's why I was thinking about the size. So then it made me wonder, why do you think some species did better than others, depending uh, on the plastic? Do you have any idea? Okay, uh, the size uh, of microplastic, which uh, we use in this experiment, uh, was uh, about uh, 20 micrometers and uh, it's uh, like uh, the alga food for example chlamydomonas or maybe tetradesmus and uh, also it's a uh, it's, uh, uh, good uh, question because uh, in the future uh, we want to uh, make uh, another experiment uh, with using uh, the uh, smaller uh, part of a microplastic uh, about between one micrometers which uh, may be compared with the uh, bacteria with in uh, in or, or in cyanobacteria uh, in the in the uh, environment which also is uh, uh, one of type of food from from this uh, filtration culture okay thanks Thank you. Okay. I think Miriam was next with a question. In my video. Um, thank you for this nice talk. Um, we also did experiments with microplastic and I was wondering how was the uptake, the ingestion? Because, I mean, your superior species did better, I mean, Sort of had more, I suppose. I can't see the numbers, and I'm sorry that I couldn't get around to watch your video. But I'm curious, like how many beads that each one had? Because in our experiment, it was very, very low. Uh, pardon, uh, uh, can you can can you uh, repeat uh, your question? Because yes. uh, the, the the volume of 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 sound is very low, and uh, okay. Sorry, it might be. Oh, okay. my it's great. Yeah, okay. Um, I was wondering how was the ingestion among different species? You said that the competitor species uh, yeah. got more than the, uh, the inferior species, yeah? Uh, in our, ex we did the similar experiment. I mean, in, in our mesocosm, we had several species of Daphnia, but normally, the ingestion rate was very, very low. Uh, that's what I'm curious about. How was the ingestion in your case? Uh, okay. Like so how many beads? Can you remember anything per Daphnia that you measured? I guess you, they were fluorescent that you measure under the microscope. You count the numbers under the microscope. Uh, okay. In our experiment, uh, we don't uh, looking for the... Mm, parameters like, uh, for example, uh, ingestion of of the filtering yeah. rate. Uh, we on, uh, only uh, count uh, the numbers of uh, of all, uh, all of the, all individuals uh, from uh, uh, from our experiments, and uh, okay. we mm, 
it's it's uh, maybe then another step. Uh, of course, uh, I agree with you. Uh, species uh, differing uh, with the filtration rate and uh, and it could be um, one of the points of uh, the effect of, of, of microplastic and uh, the effect of on for individuals and uh, from the uh, population and the community. Uh, but uh, all these uh, species in this experience uh, are differing uh, in another uh, physiological and uh, uh, for example, uh, Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like, mean, I I didn't he, I didn't have time to 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 watch your video, so my question was irrelevant. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for this. <laughs> no, yeah. no problem. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, there are more questions. Ah, Marcus Herman. <laughs> yeah, I have one. Uh, maybe adding up a bit on what Ali said um, before. Uh, like what you tested here were like different types of microplastic particles, right? And and um, and that's fine for for the plastic itself. But um, I'm a bit questioning like, can we eventually see this response also um, occurring by natural particles? You know, such as clay particles that fall even in the same size range. Because I guess in most of these waters, they sometimes have also like quite turbid conditions, right? And and all these organisms swimming around there, they get they are facing different types of, of particles. So not only the microplastic itself. So maybe to strengthen your um, your observation, it would be nice to know if um, if the outcome is is different or or maybe even the same with with naturally occurring particles like thinking of kaolin or so yes uh, i agree uh, thanks for your question uh yes um, but this experience is uh, some when you create experiments is is, is, is something maybe Part of uh, of uh, environmental, uh, really environmental in in in, na in nature. Uh, so mm, I agree. The 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 types and the the size uh, is are differing, and it's uh, changed uh, with the uh, with the year uh, because uh, uh, we know the the the, the temperature uh, from the. Uh, stratification of 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 of, uh, of lakes and uh, the mm -hmm. the one of uh, part of 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 year uh, uh, maybe where microplastic will dominate and the, another part of year uh, maybe the microplastic is uh, one of the less of 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 uh, uh, particles suspended in the water and maybe that is another uh, another like, uh, when you say uh, particles. Uh, uh, for example, organic uh, also make uh, can make uh, or maybe uh, make that the, this effect. And uh, and I, mm. I thinking about this uh, and uh, I uh, maybe I I will uh, maybe in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Maybe even think of mixtures also. You know, like. Natural particles, plastic yes. particles in certain mixture ratios or so. I think, um, yeah, that would kind of uh, strengthen the observations. Because I feel like in this microplastic world, and also what I hear from my own lab is from the people working on it, uh, is that um, actually most of them, they don't see any <laughs> severe effects on it, like, like not really a big deal. And if they see something, it's really in a ridiculously high concentration and um, from a from a risk assessment point of view I'm yeah I'm not sure if this is then maybe a bit uh, um, over uh, overrated or so yeah. yeah yeah thank you thank you for thank the you. study there. Thanks. thank you both and there was another question in the chat I, I think I missed that sorry for that so the question was about counting microparticles in the gut of Daphnia. And I think 
Um, I don't know if you want to um, switch your audio on and ask the questions question yourself, or if that was already maybe answered with the question Miriam had. Yes, yes, it's already answered. Uh, but uh, I want one more question. Do you expect uh, similar results if you repeated the same experiment between Daphne and other cluster serons? I mean, uh, do you think that the competitive abilities of Daphne against the other cluster serons might decrease as well with the presence or uh, in case of ingestion of MP? Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question and uh, it's maybe a good idea. Uh, and now uh, I focused on, on, on the Daphnia uh, because uh, uh, Daphnia family, uh, because uh, uh, there is the dominant of, uh, of uh, freshwater lakes and the key species uh, for the communities uh, and ecosystem um, fun functioning, and uh, uh, now I prepared uh, another uh, experiment with uh, the same uh, the same uh, experimental uh, uh, okay so uh, with the, the same experimental methods, uh, um, but uh, I changed. Uh, the, the, the species only with, with Daphnia, uh, because for for the last pair, Longispina and Daphnia cuculata, you see Daphnia cuculata is uh, rapidly um, uh, rapidly dominated from the Daphnia Longispina, and uh, I only changed the, the the species of uh, of uh, Daphnia uh, for from uh, the Daphnia uh, galata, and uh, another another Sarah. Mm, may, maybe in the future, but uh, this is only uh, the uh, experiment uh, on, maybe on, on that. And in future, uh, I, I plan uh, to make... Uh... Excuse me. Yes? Excuse me. Uh, it's just because of time and then I think we have to pass the word to Marine. Otherwise, people may not be able to take the ECR workshop later on. So, Marin, are you going? So, sorry to be maybe rude, but it's just because, yeah, we want still to give some time. So, perhaps you can also discuss this um, later. Okay, thank so, you. Sorry for thank interrupting. You. We, can, uh, we can discuss from chat later. Thank yeah, you. that will be great. People have some time to eat or whatever and be prepared for the workshop. Thanks, Andros. Okay, thank you. So we are going to then our last talk of this session by Marin Siebel and the talk, the title of the talk is Temperature Fluctuations Effect on Natural Phytoplankton Community Depends on the Frequency but Do Not Diminish Ecosystem Functioning. And now I will let Marin summarize the main results. Thank you, Miriam, and thanks for staying that long and sorry that we took more time than planned for our session. So what we did, what we used the natural phytoplankton community and we exposed this to a gradient of temperature fluctuation, which you can see on the bottom of the slide. So this varied between 48 hours to six hours. And we exposed all of them to a mean temperature of 18 degrees and the uh, variability was plus minus three degrees. So in, in mean, they all had the same temperature with different um, temperature fluctuation. And one, well, the first question we had was how are phytoplankton communities affected by alternate temperature fluctuations? And what we found in the study was that the effect of temperature fluctuation depends on the frequency. And we found differences among treatments and function, um, but we did not find uh, effects on the composition. And the second question was then, does a threshold crossing fluctuation frequency exist after which uh, we would have a shift in function and composition? Um, but although we found differences between high and low fluctuation frequency and function, we did not find a tr uh, such a threshold uh, crossing effect, which um, thus limits um, or restricts our ability to forecast. Yeah. 
that's the summary of the presentation and I'm open for question. Thank you, Maren. Thank you very much, Maren. Uh, I have a question for her. Uh, it's just pop up pop out of my mind now. Uh, so of course that we expect increasing in frequency, right, of temperature fluctuation with climate change. Uh, so I was wondering how realistic it actually is like these six hours. Maybe it's may, uh, like a too naive question, but yeah, I was wondering. And yeah, so that's the, 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 the main question. So. Yeah, that's a good point. So it really, I think it really depends on, on the system you're looking on. If we have a really stable system, it might be not realistic at all. And some of the treatments we had, or like the intermediate treatment we had would maybe also cover day-night cycles and temperature fluctuations. Um, I think we would have stronger fluctuation or faster fluctuations, for example, if we go into smaller systems, um, if we would have a an, an strong uh, fluctuation in, in small system by high temperatures, um, something like this. But maybe you're also right that this is, does not really cover a kind of realistic scenario we would, we would see outside tomorrow. So I also agree on that. Maybe it's also more like interesting for us to see how, how this uh, frequency of fluctuation, and in this case, in terms of temperature, would affect our community. Yeah, sure, very interesting, thanks. Marcus, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting study. I really like it uh, <laughs> um, because it really, uh, yeah, kind of compares also this pattern of a constant temperature regime compared to, to this fluctuating um, patterns. So when we are looking at them now, my question would be like, besides maybe having during a day or, or whatever, having periods when, uh, when these organisms were exposed to high or lower temperature regimes, so maybe more in a, in a better thermal zone or less, what do you think is another reason for detecting these um, changes? that you are reporting. Because I think one of the reasons what have been reported so far is that, that people argue in the way like, okay, the more uh, uh, fluctuating temperature patterns we have, the more the, the, the organisms get into, into uh, intolerant thermal, thermal areas. But when you have only one, uh, yeah, one up and down like a, like you showed, then that it's like a long term, maybe in the other in the intolerant area, but then again a long term in the tolerant area where they can kind of recover and maybe prepare for the next stop again. Yeah, so really okay, interesting. I, what is yeah, your I, opinion? I'm <laughs> curious about your opinion. On okay, I don't know if I cover everything because yeah. I think that was more than one person in in, yeah, yeah. in this question. Um, so. Maybe first of all, also maybe related to Andra's question before, something realistic would maybe not be what we see yeah. as constant temperature or as, as like daily fluctuating, but maybe something totally random out of this because we would maybe have much more yeah. stochastic fluctuation. Yeah. Um, maybe not that much with temperature as with other factors, but also here. Um, then um, I think what we should consider here is that we really uh, had the same kind of temperature fluctuations for all in terms of, of differences in temperature. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if your question goes more into the direction if we um, change the temperature up and down and in different areas maybe of the, of the, um, of the thermal performance curve of the community. Yeah. Um, so I think here what is interesting is that that we, we did not change like um, something between uh, plus minus 10 to plus minus one degree of change, but that we always had the plus minus uh, three degree. Three. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, I expected much more differences than we, with, than we finally saw, um, mm -hmm. which shows that uh, the communities are kind of 
used to these um, changes and to fluctuate, let's say fluctuations or, or, or yeah, changes in temperature. And obviously they are adapted. And we also used 18 degrees, which was the ambient temperature the community experienced before. So um, this might also be a reason why we did not mm -hmm. find extreme differences be between the treatments. And I'm now not sure if I answered your question at all. <laughs> no, it's all fine. Yeah, I was, I was just uh, really... <laughs> enthusiastic about it. No, it's interesting. I think uh, if I'm not completely mistaken, a similar study has been condu conducted not long time ago by the Geomar uh, station uh, on muscles. Um, they have a new testing facility where they can also apply different patterns and um, uh, they found indeed also these kind of differences uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the different uh, frequencies. Uh, yeah. as well as patterns yeah yeah so yeah thank you very much thank you thanks for the question so the next one will be by pablo pablo go fast please <laughs> no here. yeah yeah it's uh, <laughs> i don't know if marine answer Mark, marcus uh, question but he she answered mine because it was about baselines changing the baselines the temperature okay. baseline of course it will be very interesting right to to, to change the, the mean temperature level, right? And see how composition is affected by that, right? But you already answered it and, uh, and yeah. Maybe just say that I work in these systems, the plantotrons, where you can manipulate the temperature in this way and they are really cool. And maybe Marine wants to say something about that, that people can go there actually and work as part of aquacosm. So, um, yeah. But so Marine, you already answered it, so you don't have to. <laughs> Because we have another question, but Matthild Schmidt. Yeah, thanks for this really amazing study. Um, as far as got, uh, got from your um, pictures, you use these phytotrons, quite big containers. However, um, from my experience, more from an environmental perspective, temperature is, of course, influencing lots of other factors, for example, the density. So perhaps it's more tremendous that um, uh, piece of water get a getting a change in temperature will, uh, for example, be in another area of the uh, water column. So um, you will find steep light gradients and so on. So could you exclude in your experimental system these kind of indirect effects or is it a combination of both? And second, um, I guess that, uh, um, uh, um, that the stability or the, uh, the heating capacity of a parcel of water is quite um, high. So um, in this uh, highly fluctuating um, temperature uh, regimes, uh, did you really change the temperature and algae is seeing of de three degrees? Is it, is it that fast in your systems? Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so yes to the second question, because what you can see here is not like a, some a scheme, but that's exactly temperatures we measured. And as Pablo already did some advertisement for our Indomesocosmos, um, I, um, yeah, we, we can do that. And um, we have an um, IT specialist who programmed it uh, and prepared it for us. And um, yeah, due to that, we are able to, to, to have also uh, the mixing in the water column, which maybe answers your first question. So what we what we can do is that we can apply the temperature in three levels of these uh, containers. And um, what we always try is first of all to have some convection and by that kind of mixing in the water column. But we also have uh, rotating pedals, which we can switch on and off. And by that we can also mix. So. Um, I think that we can re, um, mix them really well and by that um, avoid some of these uh, gradients or patterns you mentioned. Um, but still, if you manipulate temperature, you, you will always manipulate other factors as well and like oxygen or um, whatever. There are always other factors which are related to that. Um, and I think we cannot separate all the things. Thank you both. So I think we can close 
the session. Pablo, maybe you want to have some words. Yeah, I, I want to say thank you everybody for uh, for attending and uh, for especially to those who remain here at the last. And uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure. And hope we can interact further in uh, more Shallow Lake uh, conferences. And um, yeah, I don't know if uh, everybody is okay with uh, us posting a Twitter picture or, or a like. Uh, if anybody has a problem with that, we will of course not do it. I think it would be nice. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I see a lot of cameras turning on now. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, do you want to do something funny? <laughs> <laughs> That was good. Everybody laughed. So <laughs> I took a screenshot. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for coming. So I also would like to thank you, everybody, for being here, and especially to the three coordinators for this amazing um, session. I liked it very much. And that's it. So thank you, and we we'll see each other tomorrow, virtually, maybe. So see you. Thanks, everybody. We'll now close this the room. Thank and you, remember, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Thank and you. remember that you are welcome to the ECR workshop this afternoon. So, cheers. Bye bye, and thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.